The Herd, wherever you may be and however you may be listening, live in Los Angeles, iHeartRadio, Fox Sports Radio, and FS1. Christine Leahy joins me on a Friday. We are going to Miami. We are. For our Monday and Tuesday shows. I cannot wait for that. You leave tomorrow or Sunday? I leave Sunday. And uh, those will be great shows. We've got our guests lined up. We did the All-Star break last year. It was it was really some of the best stuff we've ever done at this network. So Monday and Tuesday, we'll be in Miami for the Major League Baseball All-Star game. We'll have basketball guests, baseball guests, football guests. It'll be a great show. So excited for that. Yes. So let me, though, let me, though, start with this. The Boston Celtics finalizing a trade to send Avery Bradley to Detroit Hmm, Avery Bradley. I don't know if you're aware, but Avery Bradley is really good. I think he's their second best talent. He is their best defensive player. There is no question about that. And he is their second leading scorer, 17 a game. In a league that has almost no good two guards, Clay Thompson, Bradley Beal, Avery Bradley is one of the best. He is an excellent defender. He is their second best scorer. He is now gone, as is Kelly Olenek going to a rival, the Miami Heat, their best big at 6'11". Not great, but a heck of a grinder. So in review, Gordon Hayward, 22 a game, arrives, and between Avery Bradley and Kelly Olenek, 26 points, leaves town. Here is now, from the patient Boston Celtics, their lineup. Five, eight and a half point guard, Isaiah Thomas. Jalen Brown will be their number two guard. He can't shoot. Gordon Hayward, I like, but not a top 20 player. Jay Crowder, good, solid guy, limited offensive skill. And Al Horford, first guy off the bench, guard Marcus Smart, can't shoot. And in one year, Isaiah Thomas's contract becomes prohibitive. You will be paying him a bloody fortune. So tell me again about this grand plan and this patience and this accumulation of draft picks. You do realize if you were in the West, you'd be like a seventh seed. Congrats on not inching much closer to Cleveland. And I don't think you are much closer. And in all four losses in the playoffs... The average margin was over 25-point losses. There's an old saying out there, you cannot save yourself to wealth. You can put pennies away. You can put money away. You can pay off your car payment. You can save yourself to being comfortable, a comfortable retirement. You cannot save yourself to wealth. Global wealth comes from risk. Going in with a friend on a stock, starting up a car wash, a wine store business, selling it 10 years later. That's how you get rich. The people that own this company, that own my last company, rolled the dice. Now, the Celtics keep putting away 11% of their after-tax income. Like Grandma, they've got jars of nickels and pennies all over the house. They're paying down their car and their mortgage. Every month, they are being financially responsible. We won this trade. We accumulate picks. And four years later... Isaiah Thomas, Jalen Brown, Gordon Hayward, Al Horford, Marcus Smart. How you doing? Maybe the series against Cleveland goes six. Maybe you'd be the seventh best team in the West. And now we realize how little you had to give up to get Jimmy Butler, who's better than Gordon Hayward. You know, it's ironic because the guy that owns the Boston Celtics is actually, he's a venture capitalist. Yeah. And those guys are risk, 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 risk. Venture capitalists put their own money out there all the time. He he was rewarded by getting so rich he bought an NBA team. Not just an NBA team, probably the second greatest NBA team in the history of the league. Some would argue the very greatest if you go back to the first days of the NBA. Risk, 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 risk got him ownership. But the conservative general manager, free agent Gordon Hayward, clearly wasn't free, was he? Avery Bradley's gone. Kelly Olenek goes to a rival. Remember when Nick Wright came on this show and went apoplectic? Remember when Nick Wright went nuts? 
He was sort of right. And if you're Danny Ainge, not only do you not take the first offer, you don't take any offer ever. I am done believing sources close to the situation out of Boston because they've been lying to us for three years. I am old enough to remember 10 days ago when the story was, oh, my God, the sources close to the situation say Chicago wants both Nets picks, my firstborn, and the old Boston Garden for Jimmy Butler. And then... The veil got removed because Jimmy Butler actually got traded. And it turned out you gave up Zach Levine, Chris Dunn, and you swapped the ninth and 16th picks. And it's like, oh, so Boston easily could have had him for the third overall pick. Christine Leahy. No, no, no. First of all, doesn't apoplectic mean the opposite of what just happened? I think apoplectic is when they fall asleep. I could be wrong. Anyways. It's apple. Why are those words so close together? They should be different types of words. <laughs> Apoplectic. What did you say? I don't know. At this point, I'm so amused by Nick Wright. I can't okay. stop laughing. Back to what Nick Wright was saying. First of all, Jimmy Butler wasn't worth that, and I think we saw that his his trade value was not that high, right? And mm, Paul like George, him. they didn't want him to be in the East, so they were making every deal almost impossible to make, and that is why he's now in the West. So, yes, they were asking Danny Ainge for too much, and good for him for not wanting to give up everything for a deal that they were making impossible. He just got Gordon Hayward. Now let's see what's going to happen. And, by the way, they still have all their draft picks. Yeah, I see what and happens. And they have Hayward. They lost and now Avery. they're more attractive. And now they lost Avery Bradley. I know, which totally bums me out. It bums both it, of us out because he's a really great. good NBA player. He is, by the way, he's... by the way, Gordon Hayward's better than Avery Bradley. He's not that much better than Avery Bradley. Well, offensively, Avery's... yes, he is. Well, no, Avery's Avery is a defensive player, a hundred percent. But he still averages seventeen and a half points. He's yeah. no. St- he was their second leading scorer. He's no stiff. Where they're going to feel his losses on defense. He is a trem. And by the way, there's almost no good two guards in this league. I mean, really, it's like Clay Thompson, Bradley Beal, Avery Bradley. You start running out of names. It's all point guards and wings and bigs. All right. Uh, that was fun. we got to figure out the apoplectic, ap- apoplectic. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Let me move to this. The USA Today is an excellent newspaper. USA Today. I always like the purple section. The green section was for money. Red sports. Purple was for crazy Hollywood stuff and fantastic stories. I love the purple section. It's a fine newspaper. They are uh, released a list of the top 15 NFL players who are tremendously overpaid. Joe Flacco of the Ravens is number one. Joe Flacco of the Ravens is the most overpaid guy in the NFL. All right. Hmm. Um, what's the alternative? He's a franchise quarterback. Bottom tier, perhaps, but he is. So I'm going to play a little game for you for all the people that always criticize Joe Flacco. Here are the five teams in the NFL um, that have quarterbacks that are often called overpaid. Baltimore, Joe Flacco, Washington, Kirk Cousin, Houston, Brock Osweiler overpaid, Matt Stafford, Detroit, Miami, Tannehill. Their combined record, they all have franchise quarterbacks, right? But they're all way overpaid, right? Their record was 44, 35, and 1. Each one of those teams is competitive, viable, playoff close, not chaotic. Now let's go to five teams who don't have a franchise quarterback, or at least didn't last year. Browns, Niners, Bears, Jets, Bills. They went a combined 18 and 62. So let's put those again next to each other. 18 and 62. And the other teams where you often criticize the franchise quarterback for being overpaid, those teams went 44, 35, and 1. Lousy Joe Flacco, lousy Kirk Cousins, whoever starts for Houston, overrated Matt Stafford, and, and Ryan Tannehill. 44, 35, and 1. Folks, there are things you should overpay for. Haircuts, quarterbacks. And a good pilot. You don't want your pilot having to sell pottery on the side, pay a little more. What you don't want in the NFL is chaos 
And the optics around the NFL for Buffalo, Cleveland, Jets, Bears is stay away. They can't even get the most important position right. Even when Baltimore went through that horrendous Ray Rice situation, I didn't feel the organization was chaotic. I felt Ray Rice had a real problem. But here's the irony of this. The USA Today is a fine newspaper, an American gold standard of information. The day before, they called Joe Flacco of the Ravens the most overpaid. In fact, they used the word tremendously overpaid player. What did they do the day before? They had a Baltimore Ravens preview for the season. And they listed all Baltimore's problems. Here's what they said about Joe Flacco. He's won a lot of games in the last several seasons. 83 and 55 in the regular season, 10 and 5 in the playoffs. And despite the revolving door at offensive coordinator the last few years, Flacco has seen his completion percentage rise every year. Since 2013, he set career highs in completions and yards in 2016. So the same newspaper, it is a gold standard, I prefer the purple section, that said he's the most overpaid guy in the league, the day before in their preview said, career high, consistent, getting better despite chaos, and that is my point. What you don't want in the NFL is chaos at quarterback. I'll take Ryan Tannehill, Matt Stafford, Kirk Cousins, Joe Flacco, because I don't feel like those organizations are in utter chaos. Once you are, you can't hire the best scouts. You don't get the best GM. You don't get the best coordinators. All those teams with overpaid franchise quarterbacks can still get elite free agents and elite scouts and elite coordinators. They can. So, Joe Flacco, I got your back on this. You cannot pay enough for a good pilot, a good haircut, <laughs> Or a franchise quarterback. A good haircut, huh? Yeah. I never had one until I got here. <laughs> speaking of that, uh, Christine, we are going, speaking of my haircut, we are going to Miami on Monday and Tuesday. Are Why, very, I'm changing up your style or something? No, 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 no. Well, okay. Miami does weird things to your hair in the summer. Okay. Uh, it's a little humid there. Mm -hmm. But I want to say this. I'm very excited. I just got this this morning. Um, we, you and I have not been on the air two years yet. Uh, almost. Almost, almost two years. Mm -hmm. I've never been part of faster ratings growth. I just got this this morning. We have now beaten ESPN2 in back-to-back -back months. First time ever FS1's done that. We've now beaten ESPN2 in three of the last six months. We are not yet to our fourth year of this company, and we're up almost 70% since year one. In my years of doing this, 25 years local, regional, national, I've never been part of faster growth. And what really excites me is one of our guests in Miami are our friends, Chris Carter and Nick Wright. We have done this without a leadoff hitter. We will have a morning show as of Labor Day. So not only am I excited about baseball and the All-Star break with Christine, I cannot tell you how excited I am for Labor Day and the day after when we as a network finally have a national morning show. It's an incredible thing. I've never been part of anything like it, and I'm totally fired up. My hair's not fired up for Miami, but the rest well, of I me. I didn't know if you were going to do like a little swoopage or something. Swoopage? I don't know. You know how hard it is, Christine, to even look this good? <laughs> I don't have the options you do. I don't have the hair options. You can do crazy. You can do anything every day. This is all I got. You can slick it to the side. That's not going to happen. I tried something like with my Miami hair Vice two years ago. Style? Did you see what I did two years I ago? Did. I did. I tried to forget it. <laughs> we. I tried to forget <laughs> it. It was on my head, okay? I take the heat for that. All right, coming up next, yesterday, I went nuts. In 15 minutes after I went nuts, something changed. Did they react to us? That's coming up. With True Car, find out what other people in your area pay for the same car you're looking for. On average, save three grand off MSRP. New or used, doesn't matter. TrueCar.com.
Um, I want to give you an update. Today, we'll be going live to the desert in Las Vegas for the NBA Summer League. Lonzo Ball debuts tonight. Lakers, Clippers. We are going live. Now, yesterday, Christine mocked me <laughs> because I was showing random Atlanta Hawk and Toronto Raptors practice. Taking free throws. It wasn't even practice. Those free throws will end up meaning a lot next year. If they make them. This is a live shot outside the arena where Lonzo Ball will make his Laker debut. We will be going live next hour to uh, Mark Medina, tremendous young Laker reporter. He's fantastic. I'm very excited. Tonight, a summer league debut. Lonzo Palooza debuts. Oh, is that why it says Viva Lonzo Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So bad. It's a home nacho kind of night, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'm hey. very excited, Christine. I wish you were this excited about the regular NBA season as you are about I'm summer not. league. I love the playoffs, and I love the summer league, and I love free agency. Regular season. Uh, That's weird. I want it. could be weird. Peter King started next hour going to Las Vegas as well. So yesterday we had this weird thing on the show. So I come in every morning to do the show. And Christine comes in. We have the staff, and they lay out a bunch of stuff. I'm not the first person in. Um, and, and so I'll come in, and the staff's been there 10, 15 minutes, and they lay out all the big stories of the day. Then we go through and choose about half of them, and we build the show what we think is interesting. So yesterday, uh, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting, in fact, it was the second story of the day, was the over-unders came out for the NBA, and uh, we found a tweet from R.J. Bell who had found at this site – BetOnline.ag, it's a, it's a, what do you call those, not overseas, offshore site. This is, they, they make their money on this. So these were the over-unders. And I didn't care about the Warriors, Cavs, and the Rockets. I could not get my eyes off the Lakers at 36 and a half wins and the Clippers at 34 and a half. And my takeaway was, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. I mean, the Lakers are going from 26 wins to 36 due to a 19 year old Lonzo Ball and Brooke Lopez. Uh, that, that doesn't make any sense. And the Clippers are going to be better than the Lakers next year. Lou Williams, Patrick Beverly, they've got this new point guard, Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan. Those are men. Those are grown-ups. Those are 25, 26. They're going to win a bunch of games. Now, I don't, I don't know if the Clippers are a playoff team without Chris Paul. Doubt it. But they're going to be better than the Lakers. So this was the line at 9.15 when I broadcast it and was outraged by it. About 10 minutes later, that same line suddenly changed to a much more realistic line. Now the Lakers, 15 minutes later, this was released. From 36 wins to 32 and a half. And oh, by the way, the Clippers went from 34 to 41. Translation, the power of the herd. Oh, geez. We went nuts, said We could not, they gave me this, they gave me the whole league. And I said, something's wrong with the Lakers and Clippers. Something's really wrong with that. Do we have the exact time that you, okay, good. Yeah. Ten minutes later, this is what happened. I don't know who runs that uh, overseas operation. I'm sure it's a fine company with outstanding citizens of some (laughs) province. Um, (laughs) But all I know is those are real lines. Should be noted, at 32 and a half wins, the Lakers would not be a playoff team, but it would be a nice upgrade as their young players. And at 41 wins, the Clippers probably get real close to the playoffs, somewhere in that 7-8 category, battling with some Utahs and other people. I think the Clippers probably still feel like, to me, a playoff team. They, to me, they feel like a playoff team, a bottom Western playoff team. Uh, Houston's going to be better. Clippers not as good. So there's that. All right. Let me, uh, uh, before I go, in fact, I'm just going to go now. I'm, I'm, I'm worked up. Okay. Let's go to Christine with the news. Are you going to be able to go? No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. Okay, this is a story that's going around right now this morning. But I have to call out whoever wrote this headline. And luckily for them, I don't have their name on this right now. But I'm very upset about this because the headline is, Gordon Hayward goes suit shopping at discount clothing store ahead of New Deal. <laughs> and so I'm thinking he went to like a Marshalls or yeah. a TJ Maxx yeah. or a Nordstrom Rack, all fine establishments. I get my socks there, yeah. Right. He said Joseph A. Bank. That is not a discount clothing store. That is just a place that you can walk in, buy a suit, sometimes off the rack, or you can have it custom made. That's not discount. 
No, Joseph A. Like... Bank has really nice. If you're a golfer, yeah. like they have really high-end sweater. I don't shop there, but if, if you're a golfer, that's where you shop. So whoever is writing this is probably thinking, oh, well, Gordon Hayward should be going and getting them custom made. And he's going to Joseph A. Bank, so that's discount for Gordon Hayward. And I just feel like we should give Joseph A. Bank some credit. They are, they're not a discount clothing store. In the town I lived in before this one, if you told me I've got to go to an event and I have 20 minutes to get a suit, there was a Joseph A. Banks close enough where I could get a sports coat that was fine. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we have these pictures, but apparently there was a guy that was at the Joseph A. Bank who was taking shots of Gordon Hayward, trying on jackets and suits, and he said, yeah, I need one for Friday, which is also the day That's that he where you maybe would maybe be making his press conference, his introduction. So he was there doing that. Um, I'm just impressed, actually, that Joseph A. Bank makes his size. If that's possible. Yeah, he's 6'7", right? Well, yeah, it's kind of hard to find that. You can make him custom. I think Nordstrom, you can buy them off the rack sometimes. But good for him yes. going to a sensible store, walking in like an average guy yes. and buying a suit. Uh, yeah, I don't. I think your first point, I, I don't see Joseph A. Bank as a discount no, retailer. it's not. It's no. expensive. Yeah, it is. So I don't know who that writer is, but that headline is misleading. Uh, there are reports that Jamal Crawford spoke to LeBron James, and he is interested in going to the Cavaliers after, hopefully, he hopes, um, he can reach a buyout deal with the Hawks, which mm-hmm. he's since been traded to. Um, the most that they could pay Crawford if he was on Cleveland is $5.2 million. Mm-hmm. But here's the deal. Jamal, if he, if he were to play for the Hawks, that would be his seventh team. This is a guy who's played everywhere. But he's never won a championship. Right. He's also, we've had him on the couch. He's such a nice guy, good guy, good leader, good locker room He'll person. be a broadcaster. He, he definitely will be a broadcaster. Um, and he's he's valuable off the bench. Yeah. So I feel like he's one of those guys I would like to see win a championship. And he's probably thinking, this is the end for me. i got to go to a team. I would think the Warriors would probably yeah. be a better shot. But, hey, if he wants to go to the Cavs, I'm all for it. And finally, <laughs> this is another one that kind of blew me away. Ringside seats for the Mayweather-McGregor fight are apparently selling for almost $100,000. And I thought, what is ridiculous? But I thought that was really ridiculous. And what what would be even close, what other fight would be even close to selling for 100000 And then I was shocked to find out that the Pacquiao-Mayweather fight, seats were $350,000 to sit ringside. Who pays that much money? Even if you have millions and millions and millions, 350000 you could buy a house. Yeah. Yeah, you know the way I look at it, the one thing that's happened, Christine, in my life is that technology, for instance. Mm-hmm. Technology has created so much wealth. I mean, there are days where, like, the big lieutenants at these Googles, you can make a $100 million in a day. And so I think... But are what, those the guys that want to go to a fight? I think, yes. I, I think what, boxing matches are weird. Like, you don't have to be a boxing fan to go to a boxing match. Right. Like, you have to be a baseball fan right. to go to a baseball it's an game. Event. It's an event. And so, I just, in my lifetime, the ability for people in technology, like that business or oil or energy, to make fast money. So, I think, like, to me, I would get sick to my stomach to think about that. But I think $100,000 if you work at Google, Oracle, and, and you have stock in the company and it pops and goes up 6%. You make that in an hour for the rich people. Well, I'm just happy that Mayweather is not a knockout type of guy because I get your be, money's worth. I would be afraid that if I paid hundred thousand dollars, it would be over in ten seconds. But I think Mayweather will let it go for a while. Yeah, that's news. Christine with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The herd lie news. Um, there's a saying that money just makes you more of what you are. If you were a jerk and you won Powerball, you'd just be a bigger jerk. And if you were caring and you were a giving person and you won Powerball, you'd give away more money to philanthropy. Is that money doesn't change people. It just makes you more of what you are. And what we've seen in the NBA over the last couple of years is this somewhat meteoric explosion of cap room because of the TV deal. And suddenly all these teams, more than ever before, are lottery winners. They've got all this money. But here's what's interesting about 
all this money. It just makes you more of what you are. The New York Knicks yesterday signed Tim Hardaway Jr. for $71 million. Of course, they drafted him and then traded him away for Jerry and Grant, who was traded for Derrick Rose, who was renounced so the Knicks could re-sign Hardaway for $71 million. The Knicks, NBA idiots, with all this money, are just bigger idiots. Look at the contracts. They have now paid Tim Hardaway Jr., Joe Kim Noah, Courtney Lee's okay. And here's the funny thing about Hardaway. He played really well. He had a breakout year, so to speak, in Atlanta. Well, yeah, that's because the Atlanta staff is really, really good. He became, with a better coaching staff, a much more well-rounded player. Do you really think he'll go to New York and be able to duplicate all his well-rounded skills with below Atlanta-level coaching? All this expanding money in the NBA has done, the lousy teams and the poorly run organizations just make uglier trades. The Wizards will probably spend over $100 million on Otto Porter. Since when have you thought Wizards? They really know what they're doing. The Knicks, $70-plus million for Tim Hardaway. Joe Kim Noah contract. Derek Rose deal. And I've said this for a long time. Money doesn't solve poor. Education solves poor. Get smarter so you know what to do with the money. Since the cap has expanded, what teams have done a really good job with the money? Houston, Daryl Morey, one of the primary early analytics drivers in the NBA. They got a Hall of Fame point guard. Sixth man of the year. We're able to acquire him. Lou Williams turned into Chris Paul. Oh, who else has done well? Golden State was able to figure out a way to add Kevin Durant and retain Steph and Iggy and Livingston. The Lakers' old regime, which got blown out, signed Mozgov and Luau Dang. The Chicago Bulls, which have been a very uneven franchise, not well run. Even during the Jordan years, there was a lot of infighting between Phil, Michael, and the organization. Last two years, Chicago Bulls expanding cap room, they signed Dwayne Wade, they had a weird trade to Minnesota, and they have absolutely no identity. So what money really does, in personal or business, it just amplifies what you are. And the New York Knicks are without question the worst-run NBA team since probably the Clippers 10 to 20 years ago at their very bottom. But you start, you know, it's just amazing. People think money solves problems. No, it doesn't. If you don't know what to do with the money, then you start buying goofy cars, multiple homes, land that's not worth anything, or you pay $71 million or $100 million for Otto Porter. Money doesn't solve problems if you don't know what to do with it. Peter King at the top of the hour will join us. Uh, I saw a very interesting, a very interesting football story came out. Now... People through the years have um, thought I was anti-Aaron Rodgers, and I am, of course, not anti-Aaron Rodgers. Uh, what I did at my former employer about four years ago, five years ago, I said, okay, he's great. Uh, let's not make him Joe Montana yet. And I do see, despite unbelievable raw talent, some things I don't love. A little condescending, not the greatest leader. Doesn't take enough blame, little bit of a finger pointer, by himself in the sideline, holds on to the ball a little too long. He is great, but he's not Brady, he's not Montana, he's not Manning as a leader. And, of course, when I said this, the Green Bay media outraged because it's the smallest market in professional sports. It's like a college town. They protect their own. Well, since I have said that, multiple teammates have come out. Uh, Bob McGinn, the longtime Packer reporter who now no longer has to go in that locker room, he's retired, has come out and acknowledged some of these issues were right on point. So a story came out yesterday with Aaron Rodgers. And uh, it is one of the classic, wow, this is amazing, but I'm going to ask you 
to take another deep, hard look at this stat. And that is coming up next. It is great to have you in. Peter King, top of the hour. Mark Medina, L.A. Daily News. Lonzo Ball debuts tonight. Rick Buecher stops by as well. It is an absolute pleasure to have you in. We will be at the Major League Baseball All-Star Game Monday and Tuesday. The crew of the herd will be there live. Apparently in the first hour, Pitbull. <laughs> this is funny. It always works this way. Wait, like pit, Pitbull. We'll be doing a sound check in our first oh, hour. Oh, this is fantastic. Pitbull. Yeah. Mr. Worldwide. We'll be doing a sound check the first hour of our Monday show. Will his dancers be there? Probably. Huh. So we'll be able to show you. By the way, I've done a lot of live shows. I swear to God, I can't tell you how many times somebody's been on the mic performing and practicing for a Super Bowl or a All-Star game as I'm on the air. So we've had to prepare and bring in these new microphones yeah, that you and I can use so we can... Yeah, if not, we'll just give you this Pitbull concert yeah, and take the day off. Yeah, just go live to the concert. Yes. This, can, we, can we only play, like, Ricky Martin and Pitbull intro music from the breaks? We can. I don't really want to do that. <laughs> okay, I'll, can I make the playlist? Sure, sure. Okay, cool. Okay. Thanks. So um, a lot of people see me as critical of Aaron Rodgers, but that's because most of the media waves pom-poms. And when you offer some uh, context and data – uh, and the media increasingly is just not reporting but supporting. They have a side, they have an agenda, and they're not moving off it if you give them facts. I've said before, first ballot Hall of Famer Aaron Rodgers. I've said if I could start it, my franchise in the NFL today, my first pick would be Aaron Rodgers. Now, two years ago it was Andrew Luck, but he's coming off an injury, hasn't thrown in six months. So you know if how much I love football. If I would start my NFL franchise, I'd start it with Aaron Rodgers. Okay, so put down the pom-pom for a second. This is a stat, as I do this for the next three minutes, that Packer fans will get all worked up. Aaron Rodgers will be the first quarterback with 300 touchdowns before 100 interceptions. And everybody's like, wow! And I'm like, all right. First of all, interceptions, because increasingly in the last five years, a majority of Aaron Rodgers' career, it's become a bubble screen league. Brady doesn't throw picks. Even guys who throw picks are throwing fewer picks now. So he also has, in my opinion, next to Andy Reid, uh, you can argue Mike McCarthy is one of the really smart offensive play callers in the NFL. So he's got a league and a culture which has changed where most people don't throw interceptions like they used to. It's been coming down five straight years. And he's got an elite offensive play caller in Mike McCarthy. But secondly, we overplay interceptions as a negative. I'm going to list a bunch of guys who have combined have won 17 Super Bowls. They all threw a ton of picks. Elway, Big Ben, Eli, Aikman, Peyton, Manning, Farr, Bradshaw, Drew Brees. And they won a Super Bowl. Here's who hasn't. Alex Smith. He doesn't throw many. And here's who's won only one, and we all think he should win more, Aaron Rodgers. Risk is a really good thing, even in football. Who is the first coach in this league to say, you know what, I'm going to start going for it on fourth down? Bill Belichick. Who is the first coach in NFL history that decided, I'm going to make not one trade, two trade. I'm going to start trading stars for multiple picks and players. Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson changed the NFL. He was the first coach, GM, who started making massive changes on an annual basis, turning over his roster. And Jimmy Johnson is as good as any coach in my lifetime, period. Bragging that you don't throw a lot of picks is a little bit like bragging. I've never, as a businessman, had a whiff. Every business I've ever invested in has worked. I wouldn't brag about that. Elon Musk, Mark Cuban, they're not 100 for 100. Business, Main Street, Wall Street, it's risk. Warren Buffett, not all the stocks work. In Silicon Valley, the biggest hits, Uber, Pinterest, Snapchat, Airbnb, you know what they call them? Unicorns. Because they're so rare. But venture capitalists, 
100,000, 100,000, 100,000. They keep, they paper the room, 100,000, and they pray that one out of 15 to one out of 20 hits a home run. They're not trying to be perfect. They don't live in a world. Business isn't a world of perfect. It's a world of managing, managing risk, managing employees, managing bad days. So the geniuses in our society make mistakes all the time, whiff, strike out all the time. And one of my primary complaints about Aaron Rodgers, that he holds on to the ball too long. I know a former teammate of Aaron Rodgers, and his complaint was from the offensive side, sometimes Aaron just needs to throw it in the crowd and let a player come up with it. I wrote a book, my first book, about Andrew Luck. And I went back and I tracked the 18 interceptions of his rookie year. Only nine were what I believed to be bad interceptions. Either a pick six, you throw it deep into your territory, or you throw it in the red zone where you take away your own points. Otherwise, it's a change of possession. And then if you dig deeper, do a little analytics, football's very simple. The average team gets 12 to 13 possessions of a game in the NFL, and the average team scores about 22 points. Translation, teams only score on about one out of five possessions. So a change of possession is not a death penalty. Teams change possessions regularly. What you don't want to do is throw an interception deep in your territory inside the 25, nor do you want to throw an interception in the red zone where you take away at least a field goal. But I'm not blown away, fanboys, by this guy will throw 300 touchdowns before 100 interceptions. I'd rather Aaron Rodgers throw a few more picks. I'd rather Alex Smith throw a few more picks. I wouldn't be opposed to Tom Brady throwing the ball down the seam more and throwing a few more picks. If you've got a reasonable defense or you've got the kind of offense that can overcome an interception, go for it. I can remember RG3 winning Rookie of the Year over Andrew Luck. And it's a ridiculous vote, and I was proven right, that what they were basically doing with RG3 is shrinking the field to a college field. They asked him to basically make one read. They asked Andrew Luck to memorize the playbook. And so, yes, RG3 made virtually no mistakes. But Andrew Luck took the worst team in the league to 11 wins because he took risks. He threw it down the field. He made defensive coordinators cover everybody. We have gotten to a point now where we're overly complimenting safety. Throw the ball down the field. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to see. You can bubble screen it to death. That's one of my knocks on Ryan Tannehill. Ryan Tannehill, inside of 15 yards, is terrific. Get it down the field. Take chances. Take risks. Peter King, top of the hour. Mark Medina, L.A. Daily News, Lakers reporter. Rick Buecher also joining us here on a Friday. We will be Monday and Tuesday in Miami at the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. Very excited about that. All fired up. Here's quarterbacks, for the record, with 300 touchdown passes. Throw this on the screen again. Look how many of those guys threw a ton of picks. Phillip Rivers throws a ton. Elway, Roethlisberger, Eli. I don't have Fran Tarkenden's numbers, but he threw a few. Marino did, because Marino had a huge arm. He'd throw it into traffic. Breeze, Favre, Peyton Manning. Like, Brady's the only one that really doesn't. And, and I would say this, they have been on the forefront of the bubble screens. And so, I mean, again, Belichick and Brady shrink the field, high percentage passing. And you can look at that and say, that's the way you should do it. But how many teams have Belichick? How many teams have Brady? You just don't. You have to play with what you have, and most quarterbacks can sling it. And my take is, then sling it. I'm okay with it. By the way, Fran Tarkington, my staff just looked this up, had 266 interceptions. And when I was a kid growing up, he was probably the third, fourth best quarterback in the league. He was. All right, um, so I saw something this morning, really interesting article, and um, the disparity between – one side and the other is greater than I thought. And I think today we should change the world coming up next, <laughs> or at least a little. That's really ambitious. A little chunk of the world. That's next. It's the herd. 
Ah, this is the herd. Wherever you may be, and however you may be listening, live in Los Angeles, iHeartRadio, Fox Sports Radio, FS1. Christine Leahy's joining me. Monday, Tuesday, we are in Miami for the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. Pitbull in the background. Very excited for that. Christine's making a playlist. I'm totally making a playlist right now. I'm very excited about it. Uh, I started the show today. Avery Bradley is going to be traded to Detroit. So when you say you got Gordon Hayward for nothing, well, you had to give up Avery Bradley and Kelly Olenek. And combined, they are worth 25 points a game. And Gordon Hayward scores 22 points a game. And so when you tell me you're pinching your pennies and, like Grandma, putting nickels and pennies in a jar and saving up for a rainy day with all those draft picks, I like Gordon Hayward as a finisher better than Avery Bradley and Kelly Olenek. But Avery Bradley was your best defender, one of your best two guards, a really good kid, Danny Ainge's best draft pick of the last 22, and they had to get rid of him to clear space for Gordon Hayward. So the Boston Celtics, who have been the patient team, will not dip into their 401K. They are paying off their mortgage and their car payment. But their starting lineup next year is five eight-and-a-half point guard Isaiah Thomas, who within a year is going to have a max contract. Jalen Brown can't shoot. Nice player Gordon Hayward, though not a top-20 player. Al Horford and Jay Crowder. And the first guy off the bench, Marcus Smart, not much of a shooter in a shooter's league. So again, I'll say it. I believe that NFL draft picks are more valuable than basketball draft picks. First of all, the NFL has seven rounds, not two. There's just more football talent in America than there is basketball talent. The other thing is when I draft an NFL player, I've got three or four years of tape. It reduces the number of busts. i got to do a lot of guessing with basketball players. And number three, college football players come into my program at 22 or 23 years old if they redshirted 23. NBA players come in at 19. They really haven't fully developed emotionally. I certainly hadn't at 19 years old. I was certainly much more mature at 23 than 19. Now, there is a tipping point with maturity. I think once you get to 50, you're not going to be significantly more mature at 53 than 50. But the gap of maturity and emotional stability, 19 to 23, is significant. So I think accumulating draft picks, i.e. cheap labor in the NFL, makes a lot of sense for most teams. I think accumulating all these draft picks of Danny Ainge's last 22, zero all-stars. And he's considered a good drafter. And he just had to give up his best pick of the last 22, Avery Bradley. So when you tell me free agent, it's not that free. Gordon Hayward, 22 points comes in, 25 points. Olenek, Avery Bradley, goes out. I don't think it makes Boston that much better. Certainly not beating LeBron and the Cleveland Cavaliers better. Well, it's getting to football season, folks, and via the Cowherd Global Satellite Network. Peter King, great site, MoneyMorningQuarterback.com. And Peter is wearing a Stanford shirt, one of my favorite coaches in the world, David Shaw, uh, who you recently interviewed. A lot of people think Shaw should enter the league you cover. Why doesn't he, Peter? Well, you know, I've known David Shaw now for three or four years. Uh, Not well, uh, but I've known him enough to, to talk to him occasionally. And so I had him on my podcast this year. I went out to Stanford, and I did both he and Christian McCaffrey uh, for sort of long conversations on my podcast. And David Shaw has told me in the past, look, I have friends on all 32 NFL teams or in their front office or scouting staff. You know, he and his dad have a long history knowing NFL people and obviously his father having been in the NFL for a long period of time. So, uh, and he said, I, I know people in all 32 teams, and I'm happier than all of them. And, and he also told me, he said, look, you know, if, if you're going to convince me to leave here, which I don't want to do, but if you are going to convince me, you've got to start with my wife and tell her that their town is better than Palo Alto. <laughs> and so I, I, don't, I don't see it happen. I see it happening one day. I really do. And in fact, 
the Los Angeles Rams this year wanted to explore David Shaw, didn't necessarily want to hire David Shaw. They wanted to explore David Shaw and basically were told, hey, he's not on the market right now. And so we'll see what happens in the coming years, Colin. But I think one of the things about David Shaw that everybody needs to know is, and this reminds me of something Tom Brady told me after the Super Bowl, hey, I got the answers to the test now. Nobody can fool me. And that's what David Shaw does with his offense with seemingly, anyway, the proverbial lesser talent in the Pac-10. I think he figures out week to week how to game plan to be very competitive. I think one of the real stories in the NFL, and now you're starting to gear up. I find myself going to MMQB.com now on a more regular basis. We're starting to gear up. I think the story that's not being reported much to this point is Andrew Luck hasn't thrown a ball in six months. And I look at the Ryan Grigson situation where they replaced him. Is it possible, Peter, how possible, that Andrew Luck lost years on the back end of his career and the new Andrew Luck may be, may be a different version? He hasn't thrown in six months. Well, I'd hardly blame Ryan Grigson for that, although I know that there are a lot of people in Indianapolis who want to blame Ryan Grigson for everything, and I get it. I think one of the things that I have laughed at this off season is uh, Jimmy Ursay, the owner of the Colts, said that he had, he brought in Howard Mudd to look at this offensive line. And Howard Mudd said, hey, you've got a really good offensive line, really good young talent on that offensive line. This is not in crisis or anything. Well, for the last two years, everybody has been saying that the Indianapolis Colts have a horrible offensive line. It's Ryan Grigson's fault. He gets fired. Ding dong, Grigson's dead. And then all of a sudden, we have reinvented history. And now, hey, this offensive line is pretty good. Well, which is it? The offensive line is the, is terrible, and it got uh, uh, it got Matt Hasselbeck and then Andrew Luck hurt, knocked out in 2015, and then Luck was never right in 2016. I, I mean, that's why, to me, I, I just, you know, as I get older, Colin, some of the things I hear and some of the things that people try to convince us are true. When Jimmy Ursay t- says that he's brought in Howard Mudd and Howard Mudd has said, man, you got a great offensive line. What would Howard Mudd have said last December if Jimmy Ursay had asked them? You got a great offensive line? Then they wouldn't have had any excuse to fire Grigson. It's interesting. The USA Today had a story that Joe Flacco is uh, wildly overpaid. And I thought it was funny the day before in their in their Ravens preview, they said that he was the constant for an inconsistent offense. So which is it? But my point is, I put up five teams for my viewers today where we think the quarterback's a little overpaid. And those teams were from Brock Osweiler. It was the Ravens. The Redskins with Cousins, the Texans, Matt Stafford, and Tannehill, they went 44-35-1 and last year. Could I make the argument there are a handful of things in America you should never go cheap on? A good pilot, a haircut, and a quarterback, and that overpaid's a relative term. What is your takeaway on Flacco's contract and his playing ability today? Well, the highest paid quarterback today in the NFL is Derek Carr. And Derek Carr is making 1% less on the salary cap, okay, meaning the percentage of money that his contract takes up on the Oakland Raiders $168 million cap this year than the highest paid quarterback was 10 years ago. So in 2007, the highest paid quarterback was paid more percentage-wise of the salary cap than Derek Carr is this year. That's why everything is relative. When you tell me that a quarterback, that you've got to pay your quarterback one-seventh of your salary cap, I say, so what? That's, that's about what a great quarterback and your most important player probably should make. What is Gordon Hayward, uh, you know, and, and, and what is Blake Griffin relative to their salary cap? You know, of the L.A. Clippers and the ball, I don't even know what Gordon Hayward signed for. But I know Blake Blake uh, Griffin was $35 million a year. And for a guy who misses a bunch of games every year, it's totally bizarre to me. But I'm saying that I don't think the percentage of what a quarterback is making now is any more than it has been. And I'll just say this about Flacco. Don't tell me that Joe Flacco's overpaid. 
I don't want to hear it. And here's why. The Baltimore Ravens gambled in not paying Joe Flacco what they considered to be market rate, about 18 or 19 million or whatever it would have been before he won the Super Bowl. Then he went out and he won the Super Bowl yeah. and he needed to be paid. He needed a new contract. So what's he going to take? Is he going to be the seventh highest paid quarterback? No, he's going to leapfrog everybody and be number one in the standings. That didn't even last for a year, but it is all a game of leapfrog at the quarterback salary uh, on the quarterback salary scale. Jason Whitlock and I have gone back and forth on this topic, which I'm from Seattle and I find it interesting. Russell Wilson's really good, but there are multiple stories that in that locker room sometimes there can be battles. When Pete Carroll won a Super Bowl a couple years ago, I was talking to a couple of guys in the league who I really respected, mature players, and they're like, you know, Pete's quirky. It didn't work the first time. It's a little pro player. It's a little rah-rah. Well, it works, right? He's built a really in unique culture that, like, now people are duplicating, like Dan Quinn in Atlanta. But when you read these stories about Russell Wilson and, and, and some infighting on the team, could I make the argument that even at USC, Pete tends to be almost to a fault pro player? The problem being is then all of a sudden when your defensive stars take over a locker room, the history of the NFL is loud locker rooms don't win. You know, they they don't historically. Do you feel like Seattle has ever gotten a little out of control or is veering toward that with their outspoken nature of stars? I think they got out of control when Richard Sherman went after the play calling on the sidelines of a game. What is that? You can't have that. I mean, as smart a guy, and look, Richard Sherman wrote a column at the MMQB for two years. I love the guy. But the fact is, I have a real problem with somebody who goes after an assistant coach on the sidelines and tell him, don't make that call. What are you talking about? You know, so Pete is this egalitarian guy who runs a very Democratic locker room. Yep. He looked the other way for the last year or so of Marshawn Lynch acting very petulantly even when he wasn't delivering, because he understood that Marshawn Lynch was beloved in that locker room. So basically, he allowed this thing to just have a, you know, sort of creeping out of controlness. Yeah. Okay? And that's the way Pete is going to coach. And look, who can knock it? He won a Super Bowl. They're in contention every year. The only time you're going to be able to knock it is when they go 8-8 eight and eight and there's infighting in the locker room. It hasn't happened yet. The defense is getting aged all their big stars now are 28, 29, 30, whatever. And so, with the exception, I think, of Bobby Wagner, who's 27. Uh, and so, look, you know, this, this is a vital year. And it's a vital year for another reason, Colin. Okay? The Seattle Seahawks should be the best team in that division. Yes. And, you know, the 49ers are not going to stay dormant for long, in my opinion, with Kyle Shanahan as coach. They'll have a quarterback opening day 2018 who will be the quarterback of the long-term future. Who will it be? Sam Darnold, Josh Rosen, the Wyoming guy, Kirk Cousins? I don't know. But they will have a quarterback opening day 2018. So I believe that right now, and, and with Jared Goff working now with Sean McVay, uh, you know, when a decent defense, obviously with the Rams, it's a very interesting division. But right now, today, the Seattle Seahawks have to be two games better than any team in this division, or else I'm going to look at that locker room and I'm going to say, maybe the locker room is affecting how they're playing on the field. The MMQB.com. What's the name of your podcast, Peter? It's just called the MMQB Podcast with Peter King, and I'm taking three weeks off uh, during the summer, but I'll be back uh, in late July with some really, really good ones. I love the podcast genre. And it's going to be better than ever this year. Are you one of those guys that summers in Nantucket and watches Red Sox games? Is that what you do? No, I summer on the Upper West Side of Manhattan taking naps on the couch <laughs> and doing laundry and doing the dishes so that I could make up for all the garbage that I put my wife through the whole year. So, that's my vacation. That. So, it sounds like me. <laughs> that's, that's what sounds like my life. Uh, great talking <laughs> to you, Peter. All right, Colin, take care. All right, the great Peter King, MMQB.com. Uh, coming up around the corner, we're going live to Las Vegas, baby. It's Summer League, Lonzo Palooza. This better be better than yesterday. Uh, you're darn right it better be and will be. 
going to Vegas in a couple of minutes. Mark Medina, L.A. Daily News. He's got all sorts of stuff on Lonzo Ball, who debuts tonight. I'm very excited for this. I'm strangely excited. What are, you, what are you hoping to see when Mark Medina goes live from Las Vegas? Well, hopefully Mark's there. Well, right. But, like, when you're watching, what are you looking for? And why are you so excited about this? The Summer League? Yes. Um, because there are times in my broadcasting career or my sports life, my professional career, when there are movements and things happening. And I've never been into, I never wanted to be, it's a good question by you, because I've never wanted to be the sportscaster who pounds on a table. I'm not talking soccer. Yeah, but the audience is watching it. I'm not talking UFC. I never wanted to age as a sportscaster, be an old guy reluctant to evolve. And so I'm always looking for things that are exciting young people. And that's why I'm, last five or six years, I'm looking at the data on soccer, and I'm like, kids like watching it and my audience has to grow and why i don't talk golf and i used to it's why i do talk some ufc and i believe lonzo ball from what i have heard about people who have seen him in gyms with nba players when the younger brother of lonzo has two million instagram followers that's a movement that's a cultural move here and at 50 years old i i, I don't always connect on that stuff that instagram world but I don't want to be the sports guy who is standing up there fighting for regular season baseball talk. I'll do the all-star game. I'll do the playoffs. But I want to watch young people. I've, I've said this for, since we've known each other. The, the audience really drives the bus for this show. You tell me what you like. I watch my podcast and digital and TV numbers. The minute you get bored with something, I move off it. There's a reason I do a ton of NBA because the NBA has got good storylines. And a lot of stars. I can mention the best player for seven baseball teams, and you and I got nothing against baseball. I'd talk it more if they promoted stars the way that the NBA did. I really believe Lonzo Ball's going to become, as long as he can play, kind of a movement. And you know how Christine, that Steph Curry broke into the league, and a lot of NBA teams were stubborn. A lot of coaches, Byron Scott, not into. Daryl Morey of of uh, Houston is like what Golden State's doing. This is the future. The teams that embrace the three are now thriving. The Knicks initially didn't. The Lakers initially didn't. That's why they brought Luke Walton in. Luke's like, get me three-point shooters. So I just think there's no real nobility in life to grasping onto the past. I love new stuff because I want to I wanna be the host that ages reasonably well. I know that in about six years, my prostate's going to fall right out of my pants. Oh. Well, I mean, that I'm going to be like. way too much of an overshare. But before that happens, I would like to be the sportscaster who looks for the new stuff and hopefully embraces it. And sometimes I'll whiff. I'm not, you know, sometimes I'll grab something and it's just not. It, mm. Sorry about that. My, my, uh, that was bad. I've got I mean. bad images in my mind. Yeah, that, I, my mind too. <laughs> in my slacks right now, i got bad ah. images. Prostate, sorry. I apologize for that. Let's go to law. No, I can't go to Las Vegas. Let's go to Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. Uh, Kelly Olenek has agreed to a four-year deal worth $50 million or maybe a little more with the Miami Heat. Uh, that's kind of what they've been looking for as a floor-spacing big man, so it does make sense for them. Yeah. Um, you know, good for him. I thought Kelly Olenek had some good games for the Celtics. He really fit in well with them. Grinder. Great guy for the locker room. Now they have now now Miami. Christine has Hassan Whiteside. He's yep. a real player. Kelly Olynyk. Yep. Uh, I think Justice Winslow is a good athletic wing, not a big scorer. Goran Dragic, Deion Waiters. Would you? I I believe this. Cleveland, Boston, Miami, third best. Well, team. They definitely got better. They got I need better. To see them play. Yeah, but I think I think Miami feel. Listen, Pat Riley's a deal maker. He couldn't this year land the big deal, but he did make the team better. So now the question is, is Kelly Olenek going to go shop at Joseph A. Bank for his suit? Or is he going to get like not an all-white, fancy yeah, thing my, for his press conference? Yeah, he's not not in Miami. Can you wear a head-to-toe white outfit while we're there? Uh, that's not going to happen. Are you sure? I'm positive. I think to fit in with the culture, I'm, you should do that. I'm going to fit in with whatever my limited culture is. Your pants. You're going to yeah. fit in your pants. My jeans. <laughs> 
Uh, Peyton Manning, um, there's a story coming out about him today from Bruce Arians. And remember we talked about uh, books yesterday and like what kind of books you get for Father's Day? I think this would be the best one possible for you. Bruce Arians wrote a book about quarterback coaching. Like the psychology, what goes into it. That, that is so up your alley. Is it available? Available Tuesday. Oh, that's great. So you can go to the Barnes & Noble in Miami and purchase one. Do you know Kindle. what the name of the book is? It is called The Quarterback Whisperer. Oh, that's great. Yes. So I think you're going to like it a lot. And yeah. here's one story that came out today about Peyton Manning. Um, this was when he was serving as a quarterback's coach early in Peyton Manning's career. And I think this was his rookie year. The Colts were trailing really, really bad during a game. And midway through the fourth quarter, uh, Peyton came out and said that he wanted to be pulled from the game. So Arians told him, quote, F no, get back in there, we'll go no huddle, and maybe you'll learn something. You can never ask to come out. You're our leader. Act like it. Wow. So he put him back in the game. He wound up scoring a touchdown um, or making a pass for a touchdown. But I just thought that was a really cool story because you could, maybe as a veteran you can ask to come out of the game when it's a blowout, but not as a rookie. you got to stick that out, right? Yeah, and also most you know leadership should not want out. Right. You have to see it through. Yeah. Lead your guys through tough times. Yeah, especially in football. Yeah. I think it's a good story, and I think you should probably buy the book. And finally, there's a 12-year-old girl who has a lemonade business. She started the, this lemonade stand, and she was using her... You're looking at me like I'm crazy, but I swear there's a point to this. Uh, her grandmother's recipe, she's using it. It's like something with honey, and it's from the 1940s. Well, it got so much attention that stores wanted to buy this lemonade and sell it in their stores. And now there are NFL players investing in this company. Uh, Arian Foster is one of them. EJ Manuel is one of them. And it also goes back to support a good cause. And it's called Me and the Bees Lemonade. Sweet lemonade. That's great. Nice I think model. it's really cool that all these <laughs> NFL players are investing in it. And apparently it's very, very good. Mm. And also never lose your grandmother's recipes. <laughs> no because kidding. those are the best ones. And they are. Christine with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Lie News. All right. Lonzo Palooza begins tonight. It's only the Summer League, but I believe the Lakers will smash records, uh, attendance and TV records. I want to go via the Coward Global Satellite Network to Las Vegas, Thomas and Mack Center. Our friend Mark Medina, LA Daily News. Look at he's got a he's got a herd mic. That is fantastic. You're really wait, 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 wait. <laughs> the first reporter we ever have for the herd, and we're doing. Summer League. Yes. And the first, the first heard microphone. I love this. Is this. big news, Mark Medina. Okay, so you've been watching, Mark. You've been watching all these Summer League practices. What's your takeaway? Well, the practices have been closed, but I've been at Summer League the past few years. And, you know, it's easy to say it's just Summer League, but when you look at the attendance, 38% of Laker fans go to the games, and there's been a lot of interest for two reasons. They've had lottery picks, so this is their early glimpse of – what, is, what does this guy bring to the table? What does D'Angelo Russell look like? What does Brandon Ingram look like? And then there's kind of an element of intrigue of what do the role players look like? And they've uh, had some nice surprises in recent years where guys like Larry Nance Jr. and Avita Zubat suddenly became fan favorites because they were able to bring a lot of good hustle plays. So kind of circling back to this year's Summer League, the obvious attention is going to be on Lonzo Ball and what kind of player he is. But there's so many other storylines as well. Brandon Ingram's coming back. Avita Zubats is coming back. And then they have another handful of draft picks and Kyle Kuzma and Thomas Bryan and Josh Hart, uh, not to mention David Nwaba from the D-League last year, that, hey, maybe they, they bring some new surprises that could make this uh, – in for an exciting Lakers season next year. Is there, um, what do we know about like Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram and relationships now being forged through these practices? Colin, it started off really well. At Lonzo Ball's request, his locker is right next to Brandon Ingram for a very specific reason. He wants to learn from Brandon Ingram. And I think that that's kind of established two things that could be predominant themes throughout the season. Where Lonzo Ball, there's a lot of hype around him, but he has shown the maturity and growth mindset and wanting to prove himself as a professional and be a sponge. 
And then with Brandon Ingram, he kind of came in last year, number two pick. He didn't post glamorous numbers, and his shot wasn't always consistent. But when you talk to the Lakers, there's a reason why that they made him untouchable in trade talks. They're really encouraged with his work ethic, his versatility, his growth in the post, his ball handling. And now when you look at this season, uh, the assistant coach, Judd Bush, who's a Lakers summer league coach, was saying, hey, this is Brandon Ingram's team. We want him to be the leader. And I think when you look at Lonzo Ball as an example of wanting his locker to be next to his, it shows that Brandon Ingram has already built some credibility within the Lakers organization and his teammates that he could be that guy. You know, it's interesting. Mark Medina joining us uh, in Las Vegas, uh, debut tonight, Lonzo uh, Ball. Uh, last year, a lot of the Laker players were at this because they're the youngest team or one of them in the league. Now, the way the summer league works, you, you, you play draft picks, some undrafted guys. How many of the recognizable, because it's funny, if I ran the Lakers now, I'd actually want <laughs> the core group of guys playing and getting more reps. But you know how the summer league works. How many recognizable Lakers will Lonzo play with? There's going to be a lot. Okay, so Brandon Ingram is going to be there, and he's going to be in the starting lineup next season. Avica Zubats will be on the team. He's coming off the bench. And then those other draft picks I mentioned with Kyle Kuzma, uh, Josh Hart, Thomas Bryant, David Nwaba, they're all on the actual regular season roster. Now, to your point of how much they're going to play, as much as the Lakers have been talking about Brandon Ingram and him wanting to kind of build off of last year, he's only guaranteed to play at least the first three games. At the end of the day, this is summer league. They want him not to burn out and, and be uh, healthy. So I wouldn't be surprised if they shut him down at the end. But, you know, the Lakers are attaching a lot of importance with this. They've talked openly, Lonzo Ball and some of the other players, about wanting to win the Summer League championship. Uh, and I think the thought process is, is this is step one of kind of changing the culture, setting the tone after, frankly, the last four years. They haven't made the playoffs. There's been a lot of coaching change, a lot of turnover from a roster standpoint. Uh, so they, they think this is a pretty important thing when you're looking at their development. Two more questions. Uh, Mark Medina in Las Vegas, Summer League, Lonzo Ball debuts tonight. Number one, Rajon Rondo. There's talk the Lakers have a little bit of cap space left. What's the latest on Rondo possibly being a Laker? There's definitely a possibility. The Lakers have had talks with his representatives the last few days. They've also been doing research because, on one hand, you know, Rajon Rondo has a pretty good track record as a point guard. He has championship experience, but... His shooting accuracy isn't the greatest, and I think more importantly, there's been question marks at the tail end of his career when he's been at Dallas, Sacramento, and Chicago of how good of a locker room guy is he. He's clashed with different coaches, but at the same time, there's been a lot of teammates that have kind of sworn by him and saying that he was a great mentor. So I think the Lakers are kind of sifting through all that information, trying to you know, sort out fact from fiction. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't expect there to be too much of a splash in free agency. Obviously, it already started uh, less than a week ago, and they haven't done any deals. The thought process is they want to get some one, uh, guys on one-year deals, preserve that cap space for next summer when guys like Paul George, LeBron James, and Russell Westbrook might be free agents. And finally, Mark, uh, my, my prediction was that this the attendance for Lonzo is going to be big. This is going to be summer league record stuff. Um, have you heard... I mean, what is the buzz in town about tonight's game with Lonzo debuting in the NBA? Well, I've been told it, it, there's still tickets left tonight, okay. but it's almost at near capacity. Tomorrow's game, the Lakers and the Celtics, it's already sold out. So if, if you were uh, wow. thinking of, hey, I'm going to uh, play it by ear, see what happens in the debut, it, you kind of lost your chance. But the Lakers play another game on Monday against Sacramento, and then depending on how those games go, they'll have at least two other games at a time to be determined. But, I mean, the buzz has already formed. It's the Lakers, it's Lonzo, and they've been through this rodeo the past few years because they've had uh, a lot of different lottery picks and late first-round picks they want to get a glimpse of on their summer league team. Mark Medina, uh, I think we found a gem of a reporter. That was riveting. I, I, I thought I he was admit, I, I am intrigued now. If it's sold out, maybe I'll watch. Okay. And, and let me tell you something. Maybe. You definitely. Right? Yeah, let me maybe. Uh, Mark, great job, buddy. Great job. Hey, thanks so much, Colin. You bet. He's terrific. I'll tell you something. When we go live and you can see our microphone, doesn't that make the show feel it bigger? It's very cool. I like this reporter idea. 
I almost, like, just for one moment, I almost felt like I was going to the White House and I was Tom Brokaw. <laughs> I have to go live to Las Vegas, Mark Medina, breaking a huge story inside the chambers of the White House. I felt very big and networky. It looked very similar to the chambers of the White House. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't get, can't get over it. I'm sorry. I'm very excited. Would you rather me be like, listen, today in the herd, we're going to talk about backgammon. No, I am I'm just, I'm just confused why you weren't this excited about like some regular season big matchup game. No, oh, who gives a rip? I do. Like the Westbrook reuniting oh, with oh. Kevin Durant in Oklahoma City for who, the first time. That yeah. I mean, you weren't even as excited about that as you are about this. I am more excited about the future. Than I am about the past. Okay, it, okay, that's valid. I like new stuff. Like a lot of people like classic rock. More than a feeling on 97.2, Clovis, New Mexico's best rock. Click. Then can we get rid of the classic rock coming in to, from breaks? Okay. I like new stuff. I, I'm yeah. not, I don't want to hear Merle Haggard. I got <laughs> nothing against country. That's just not my thing, man. I like new stuff. Yes. More Nelly. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Uh, coming up next. We're going to change the world. A little bit of the world, but we're changing the world next in the herd. Great to have you in. Rick Buecher apparently is on fire. NBA guy next hour is going to join the show. Uh, we'll be Monday and Tuesday in Miami. Uh, very excited for that. And a tip of the cap to this network. Uh, FS1 has now beaten ESPN2 in back-to-back months. First time ever. Three of the last six months, FS1. Without a morning show until September has beaten ESPN two, three of the last six months. We are shy of four years old and we are up nearly 70%. No other sports network can say that. I'm tremendously proud and I am so excited for Labor Day when we finally have a morning show at this network. We have a leadoff hitter, which we have not had. So this growth has been due to a lot of people you do not see and the commitment from people behind the scenes as much or more than people on the air. So a very exciting time for us. Um, and, uh, by the way, Chris Carter and Nick Wright will be on our show Tuesday in Miami. That's cool. So everybody's trying to convince me that Gordon Hayward's a big uh, uh, acquisition by Boston, and I'm saying, well, they're getting rid of Avery Bradley and Kelly Olenek, and that's 25 points out the door, and he scores 23. I don't think it's that big of a leap. I think Cleveland's clearly the best team. But according to uh, hashtag NBA rank, there is a system out there where they rank players based on a variety of stats. The West now has two NBA All-Star teams better than the East's best, meaning the second-best All-Star team in the West is significantly better than the first-best team. Here is a ranking of the top players, top 14 in the NBA. LeBron's number one from the East. The remaining 13 are all Western players. And... Divisions don't mean anything in the NBA anymore. In fact, you don't even get automatic home court advantage if you win your division. I can't even, I don't even know if I could name all the divisions in the NBA. There's like Atlantic, Central, Northwest, Pacific. I mean, I, I, I can't name them all. I will say this though. I think it is time to just, you're cheating consumers if you don't do this. One through 16 regardless of conference. In football, conferences matter. They don't in basketball. Even in college basketball, Christine, when they seed March Madness, it doesn't matter what conference you're from. They'll take ten teams from the ACC and one from the Mountain West. We don't care where you're from. Basketball's not about conferences and divisions. It's about stars and who the best teams are. It's different in football. You've got the AFC champ. You've got the NFC champ. You got Brady who rarely plays the other side. You got Aaron who rarely plays the other side. In baseball, national, American, for years they had different strike zones. Basketball's not about that. March Madness is about wherever you come from, wherever the size of your school, here's the 68. And in the NBA, it's time to just blow up conferences. When you have a disparity at this level, you are cheating the fans. And Mark Cuban, listen to this. You know how for years and years, in fact, I banged on this two days ago. I said, I can't figure out. Yeah, you were on the show, Christine. I said, I can't figure out why the West for a decade to 15 years 
is better than the East. Like, I can't figure it out. Is it weather? Uh, Chris Broussard said it's just better general managers. Well, here's what Mark Cuban's theorizing. This is interesting. Okay. Mark Cuban says that he pitched a couple of years ago. Mark Cuban said, let's just do one through 16. Let's reward the people in the NBA front offices and ownership and coaches who are committing more to it. And according to Robert Sarver, the Suns owner and Cuban, the commissioner's office is not interested. The Eastern teams don't like it. But here's why Cuban says the West is, is better. Mark Cuban says it needs to be addressed. Seven of the ten smallest markets are in the West. And I believe Eastern teams know they can get by doing less. They can make the playoffs. They're larger markets. They sell tickets, get advertising, and get viewers. They get the best of both worlds. In the West, you simply have to work harder because there's more San Antonio's, Oklahoma City's. There's more Portland's. There's more Denver's. There's more smaller markets, New Orleans, Memphis. But the belief in the West is you have to work harder to get attention and to get fans and to get advertising dollars. That's makes really, sense. It makes a lot of sense. Maybe that Mark Cuban has solved what I have been looking for for years, the, the, the answer to the question, why the hell is the East so bad and the West so good? And Mark's like, because the West has more small markets, they simply have to work harder to get the fans and get advertising dollars and make it work. So, you know, this, this, this goes back to today. Let's just change the world. It's just a little piece. In college basketball, it doesn't matter what conference you're from. And in the NBA, let's just go 1 through 16. Let's not get tied up that you deserve and I deserve. Let's give the 16 hardest working owners, GMs, coaches, players, let's get them in the playoffs. The, my, my staff was joking with me this morning because I was just saying how irrelevant like divisions are in the NBA, how completely irrelevant divisions are. And so the staff said, let's play Guess the Division. And I'm being dead serious here. Right, do you have music for Guess the Division? So I'm supposed to guess the divi- You name a team and I guess the yes. division. All right, let's start with the Charlotte Hornets. Oh, Jesus. So Charlotte is Southern. Southeast Division? Wow. I did <laughs> not think you were going to get that one. Okay, let's try the uh, Portland Trailblazers. You clearly don't look at um, rankings sheets very often, do you? I, I go for the player, not the team. Pacific Division. Uh, mm. Nope, that was wrong. It is in the Northwest Division. Well, who's in that division? Well, if I told you that, that would give away like, some of the you, future When teams. you look at standings, do you not look at the divisions? I, I, I got another one. I never work. When I look at standings, I just look at the playoff rankings one through. Like conference? Yeah, like the Lakers okay. are 12th. I never look at the, the divisions don't matter anymore. They don't even give you home court if you win it. Oklahoma City Thunder. Oh, good hell. Oklahoma City? <laughs> so let me, I mean, honestly, I'm going to make it up. The Western Central. <laughs> They're also in the Northwest Division. Well, now come on, Christine. Who what? would guess that? Uh, Maybe Daryl Morey, but nobody <laughs> I know. All right, how about the Phoenix Suns? The Southwest Division. Mm. Nope, they're in the Pacific Division. New Orleans Pen- Pelicans. Well, they're out west. They're in the Western Conference. That's true. So the New Orleans Pelicans are in the Pacific Division. Mm. They are in the Southwest Division. I didn't know there was a Southwest Division. <laughs> you just thought they were an airline. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. Last one, the Detroit Pistons. Oh, they're a Midwest team leaning east. So they're in the they're in the eastern mid division. Mm. Close. Central division. Christine, I don't look at divisions in the NBA anymore. <laughs> when I was a weird. kid they're... when I was a kid it was the Lakers, the Suns, Seattle Sonics, Portland Trailblazers were in the Pacific. But now they got Memphis, that's an eastern team in yeah, the that West. Doesn't make sense. New Orleans literally is an hour flight from Miami. They're in the West. I know. And the NBA has said divisions don't matter because we don't even give you home court. So I when I look, 
I go to you go to the conference standings. That's all I care not about because that's what that's what determines playoffs. Yeah, the I Southwest has Memphis and New Orleans, but not Phoenix. The Southwest Division. The Southwest Division. By the way, what Phoenix is in what again? They're in the Pacific. What was the what, what was Oklahoma City in? They're in the Northwest. If you think about it, it does make sense because they were the Sonics. God, it's just it's, it's confusing. It is. Like, there's some things in sports there's no reason for me to look at. So my head's a parking garage. It's all full of cars. I, I There's no room for another car. So the only way I'm going to put stuff in my head, otherwise it'll clutter it, is stu- if it's really valuable. Okay. I do not need to know the divisions of the NBA. There's no value in it anymore. The NBA doesn't care about it anymore. What about baseball? I know, I know the baseball ones. Okay. Because those matter more. Because yeah. you have your division winners, home uh, field, then you have your wild card. Right. And No, I know the division ones. Okay. Baltimore, Yankees, Toronto, Red Sox, Tampa Bay. That's your yes. yeah American League East. Hour three, the herd. Ah, this is the herd. Wherever you may be and however you may be listening, live in Los Angeles, iHeartRadio, Fox Sports Radio, FS1. Very excited. Christine Leahy joining me. Uh, we went live earlier today. We did. Mark Medina, the very cynical Christine Leahy initially. I'm not cynical. Very. No. Yesterday, very cynical. I just, I wasn't as enthralled with you as at free throw practice. You acknowledge today, though, that Mark Medina's appearance using a herd mic. I thought that was very cool. And I like what he said. And the fact that it's sold out, I'll probably tune in for a couple minutes. Okay, so Lonzo Ball debuts. All right, let me start, though, with this. The Boston Celtics finalizing a trade to send Avery Bradley to Detroit. Hmm, Avery Bradley. I don't know if you're aware, but Avery Bradley is really good. I think he's their second best talent. He is their best defensive player. There is no question about that. And he is their second leading scorer, 17 a game. In a league that has almost no good two guards, Clay Thompson, Bradley Beal, Avery Bradley is one of the best. He is an excellent defender. He is their second best scorer. He is now gone. As is Kelly Olenek going to a rival, the Miami Heat, their best big at 6'11". Not great, but a heck of a grinder. So in review, Gordon Hayward, 22 a game, arrives. And between Avery Bradley and Kelly Olenek, 26 points, leaves town. Here is now, from the patient Boston Celtics, their lineup. Five, eight and a half point guard, Isaiah Thomas. Jalen Brown will be their number two guard. He can't shoot. Gordon Hayward, I like, but not a top 20 player. Jay Crowder. Good, solid guy, limited offensive skill, and Al Horford. First guy off the bench, guard Marcus Smart. Can't shoot. And in one year, Isaiah Thomas's contract becomes prohibitive. You will be paying him a bloody fortune. So tell me again about this grand plan and this patience and this accumulation of draft picks. You do realize if you were in the West, you'd be like a seventh seed. Congrats on not inching much closer to Cleveland. And I don't think you are much closer. And in all four losses in the playoffs, the average margin was over 25-point losses. There's an old saying out there, you cannot save yourself to wealth. You can put pennies away. You can put money away. You can pay off your car payment You can save yourself to being comfortable. Now, the Celtics keep putting away 11% of their after-tax income. Like Grandma, they've got jars of nickels and pennies all over the house. They're paying down their car and their mortgage. Every month, they are being financially responsible. We won this trade. We accumulate picks. And four years later, Isaiah Thomas, Jalen Brown, Gordon Hayward, Al Horford, Marcus Smart. How you doing? Maybe the series against Cleveland goes six. 
Maybe you'd be the seventh best team in the West. And now we realize how little you had to give up to get Jimmy Butler, who's better than Gordon Hayward. You know, it's ironic because the guy that owns the Boston Celtics is actually, he's a venture capitalist. Yeah. And those guys are risk, 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 risk. Venture capitalists put their own money out there all the time. He he was rewarded by getting so rich he bought an NBA team. Not just an NBA team, probably the second greatest NBA team in the history of the league. Some would argue the very greatest if you go back to the first days of the NBA. Risk, 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 risk got him ownership. But the conservative general manager, free agent Gordon Hayward, clearly wasn't free, was he? Avery Bradley's gone. Kelly Olenek goes to a rival. Remember when Nick Wright came on this show and went apoplectic? Remember when Nick Wright went nuts? He was sort of right. Ugh. And if you're Danny Ainge, not only do you not take the first offer, you don't take any offer ever. I am done believing sources close to the situation out of Boston because they've been lying to us for three years. I am old enough to remember ten days ago when the story was, oh, my God, the sources close to the situation say Chicago wants both Nets picks, my firstborn, and the old Boston Garden for Jimmy Butler. And then... The veil got removed because Jimmy Butler actually got traded. And it turned out you gave up Zach Levine, Chris Dunn, and you swapped the ninth and 16th picks. And it's like, oh, so Boston easily could have had him for the third overall pick. First of all, Jimmy Butler wasn't worth that. And I think we saw that his his trade value was not that high, right? And oh, Paul like George, him. they didn't want him to be in the East. So they were making every deal almost impossible to make. And that is why he's now in the West. So, yes, they were asking Danny Ainge for too much. And good for him for not wanting to give up everything for a deal that they were making impossible. He just got Gordon Hayward. Now let's see what's going to happen. And, by the way, they still have all their draft picks. All right, let me move to this. The USA Today is an excellent newspaper. USA Today. I always liked the purple section. The green section was for money. Red sports. Purple was for crazy Hollywood stuff and fantastic stories. I love the purple section. It's a fine newspaper. They are uh, released a list of the top 15 NFL players who are tremendously overpaid. Joe Flacco of the Ravens is number one. Joe Flacco of the Ravens is the most overpaid guy in the NFL. All righty. Hmm. Um, what's the alternative? He's a franchise quarterback. Bottom tier, perhaps, but he is. So I'm going to play a little game for you, for all the people that always criticize Joe Flacco. Here are the five teams in the NFL um, that have quarterbacks that are often called overpaid. Baltimore, Joe Flacco, Washington, Kirk Cousin, Houston, Brock Osweiler overpaid, Matt Stafford, Detroit, Miami, Tannehill. Their combined record, they all have franchise quarterbacks, right? But they're all way overpaid, right? Their record was 44, 35, and 1. Each one of those teams is competitive, viable, playoff close, not chaotic. Now let's go to five teams who don't have a franchise quarterback, or at least didn't last year. Browns, Niners, Bears, Jets, Bills. They went a combined 18 and 62. So let's put those again next to each other. 18 and 62, and the other teams where you often criticize the franchise quarterback for being overpaid, those teams went 44 35 and 1. Lousy Joe Flacco, lousy Kirk Cousins, whoever starts for Houston, overrated Matt Stafford and and Ryan Tannehill. 44 35 and 1. Folks, there are things you should overpay for. Haircuts, quarterbacks, and a good pilot. You don't want your pilot having to sell pottery on the side, pay a little more. What you don't want in the NFL is chaos. And the optics around the NFL for Buffalo, Cleveland, Jets, Bears is stay away. They can't even get the most important position right. 
even when Baltimore went through that horrendous Ray Rice situation, I didn't feel the organization was chaotic. I felt Ray Rice had a real problem. But here's the irony of this. The day before they called Joe Flacco of the Ravens the most overpaid, in fact, they used the word tremendously overpaid player, what did they do the day before? They had a Baltimore Ravens preview for the season, and they listed all Baltimore's problems. Here's what they said about Joe Flacco. He's won a lot of games in the last several seasons. 83 and 55 in the regular season, 10 and 5 in the playoffs. And despite the revolving door at offensive coordinator the last few years, Flacco has seen his completion percentage rise every year. Since 2013, he set career highs in completions and yards in 2016. So the same newspaper, it is a gold standard, I prefer the purple section, that said he's the most overpaid guy in the league the day before in their preview said, Career high, consistent, getting better despite chaos, and that is my point. What you don't want in the NFL is chaos at quarterback. All right, I just got a text from somebody who is very well connected. To what? The NBA. I just want to give you a heads up on something. I want you to know the story before the story potentially happens. This is an NBA story. This is really interesting. It, it hasn't absolutely happened, but this is a just, you know how we kind of like when stories develop and they percolate? It's kind of mm-hmm. fun, right? Mm-hmm. Like you feel like you know something before everybody else knows something? Yeah. Okay. This is a very interesting development with Avery Bradley going to Detroit. I'm going to tell you on the other side what this is. This is very, very interesting. Next. Plus, Rick Buecher's all fired up. When shopping for car insurance, consider Geico saving people money on it for 75 years. You serious about savings? It's pretty simple. Geico.com. Somebody does something well for 75 years, they know what they're doing. So I was telling you, I'm just going to throw this out there. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's just something that could happen. It Maybe maybe it doesn't happen. I just want to throw it out there. There have been discussions about LeBron one more year moving west with Paul George to the Lakers and Lonzo Ball. Well, when Avery Bradley signs with Detroit... Um, you know, he's a two guard, right? Uh, mostly. Well, what do they do with Contavious Caldwell Pope, a pretty good two guard, a young promising two guard from Detroit? Average about 14, 15 points a game, plays real defense, long, very promising kid, lottery pick two years ago out of Georgia. So he becomes an unrestricted, uh, uh, unrestricted free agent. Here's the teams that are interested in uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope. They call him KCP. The Nets, the Knicks, the Lakers, and the Hawks. What don't the Lakers have? A starting two guard. What do the Lakers need? A starting two guard. If this young man is willing to do a one-year, like $17 million deal, does it open the door for LeBron? Because who reps Contavious Caldwell Pope? Rich Paul, LeBron's best friend. I think that's pretty exciting. Is this some conspiracy theory stuff? Well, it's, no, it's not a conspiracy. It could happen. It would just be uh, giving you a sense of what could be in the works. You are like a psychic. Without a phone number, yeah. I don't <laughs> have like one of those psychic phone numbers, but yeah, kind of. Well, H-E-R-D. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Let me throw this out there. I'm getting a text on my phone, and it's not telling me who it is, but he tells me my Celtic takes stink. Uh, yep, I would agree. And maybe it's me and my bat phone. Well, I think it's Bill Simmons, because he only reaches out when I bang on the Celtics, and the number's not coming up Bill Simmons, but it is an L.A. number. What's the area code? Well, I don't want to do that. It's an area code. Well, it's a... it's a. Uh, okay, hold on. That's, that's not giving that anything can, away. There are thousands of people with that area TV. code. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, my phone's frozen. Hold on, my phone's frozen. Uh, it's three two three. Oh yeah, that's LA. Okay, so 
Okay. Here's my takeaway. Is that Avery Bradley, 17 a game, great defender, gone. Kelly Olnick, grinder, 9-10 a game, gone. 27 points out the door. Gordon Hayward in 22 points. Free agents aren't that free. This sense you didn't have to give anything away for Gordon Hayward. I like Kelly Olenek, and I really, really like Avery Bradley. And I think all this stuff is, I think draft picks in basketball are different. I, You know what I honestly think? When you live in Boston, Boston's a very, very educated town. MIT, Harvard, 32 universities within the Boston, Boston Metro. University. Sloan, uh, they have that Sloan the conference. conference. It's the analytics conference. A lot of NBA guys go to that. Everybody's in the shadow of Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick is the greatest football coach ever. Tom Brady's the best quarterback ever. Nobody in Boston wants to be the dumb team. The Bruins won a Stanley Cup based on the acquisitions of a GM that was from Harvard. The Boston teams in the shadow of the Patriots all want to be the smart team. Nobody wants to look like the dopes. The Red Sox going on analytics. Uh, the Bruins to win a cup went in on analytics. You look at Boston sports teams, everybody's in the shadow. They're all trying to attain fans and stay kind of up with the Patriots. But in the football, it is about attrition. It is about having cheap labor. It is about accumulating draft picks, paying your starting quarterback a star, paying everybody else nothing. That's the opposite of what matters in basketball. Basketball is about getting stars, not about accumulating anything other than stars. The NFL draft is seven rounds. So there's a lot more football talent in America than basketball. NFL draft picks come with three and four years of tape, fewer whiffs. College football players arrive at 22, 23 years old. They're men, not boys. The NFL draft is more trustable than the college basketball draft. So Danny Ainge, in the shadow of the Patriots, wants to look shrewd and accumulating draft picks and being cerebral. Because everybody has that sort of, I mean, if you grow up with a smart brother, you don't want to be the dope. If you grow up in a neighborhood, everybody looks for the smart, rich guy. You grow up in a city with the Patriots, there's some self-esteem checking. Everybody wants to be as smart as the Patriots. And so Danny Ainge is going to accumulate draft picks. Ask yourself this. The Miami Heat have three titles. One drafted player has been key in that, Dwayne Wade. Did the Lakers draft Shaq or Wilt or Kareem or Gasol? Did the Sixers draft Dr. J.? Do the Celtics draft Ray Allen and KG? There's very few players in this league, D. Wade, Tim Duncan, Steph, where a team drafts it, and then they win. He's the star for 15 years. Even LeBron left Cleveland. They got him back as a free agent. And so I I don't buy into this whole Danny Ainge four years into this. And my takeaway is if they won 53 last year, maybe they win 57 next year. But now Miami's better. Cleveland's as good. I I like Gordon Hayward. But you just lost Avery Bradley, really good defender, one of the few good twos in the league, who's averaging 17 a game. You lose Kelly Olenek, a glue guy with some size on the back end. And your starting lineup is a five eight and a half point guard. Jalen Brown can't really shoot. I like Gordon Hayward, not one of the 20 best players in the league, but I like him, probably the 20th best player, frankly. And then you're going into Al Horford, and you're going into some guy they just got in the Bradley deal, the second best brother in a family. There's two guys that play in the NBA. There's the older brothers, the better one, I think, and the younger guys, the they're twins, right? Okay, so they're the same age. They got the one that's not quite as good. <laughs> and then it's Marcus Smart who can't shoot off the bench. So you got Marcus Smart and Jalen Brown are not really highly offensively skilled. Jay Crowder's okay, good contract, good defender, not overly skilled. I mean, I just, I, I just, I, you know, my takeaway on Boston's moves is it's a lot of, you're moving up like inches, not feet or yards. You're, you're moving up inches here. And I just don't think that's the history of the league. The history of the league is do whatever it takes. If you have to overpay, get stars. They win. They advance. They win third and fourth round picks. I mean, Otto Porter, I'm not signing that guy to 100 large. I'm not doing it. John Wall, I'll pay money to. I'll pay money to Bradley Beal. I'm not paying that for Otto Porter. I'll pay my stars whatevs, but I'm not paying average guys huge money. Boston's got a lot of average guys. Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. Do you think you're going to go to the uh, Mayweather-McGregor fight? I'm gonna. What if we broadcast from there? Is that an I don't, option? I don't know if I am. If, I, if you know, if we broadcast from there, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna pay for it. Like oh, to watch on TV. Yeah, I'll mean? watch it on TV. But I just. Okay. 
Do you want to be in there and just know I got... I really could have done something else. With your time. Yeah. I feel the same way. Apparently, a lot of people, though, disagree because tickets are going for almost $100,000 to sit ringside for this. Uh, the Pacquiao Mayweather fight tickets were 350000 to sit ringside. Uh, I don't understand it, no. but uh, I just hope it goes a long time. I hope that Mayweather lets... I, I have a little bit of a s- sneaking feeling that the video McGregor is putting out to the public is meant to make him look bad. Oh. Mayweather released video, and then McGregor did. And I I think McGregor knows it looks awful. And so he's sending... Here's the video right now. We're showing it. He's slow. Yeah, I mean, he's sending it out to look awful. Like he, That like, could be, but I also think there's a bit of delusion with him. Because yeah. if you look at Mayweather's video, obviously it's very fast. And McGregor commented, you're in quicksand. So does he really think that, well, watch, or is he delusional? Because, Christine, look at the video they're showing right now. Now tell me I'm wrong on this. It's perfectly framed. They're trying to make it look like it's, ooh, private video. That's video perfectly framed that they wanted out to the public. And it doesn't make him look good. I mean, look at those cornball. he thinks lo- he looks good. Oh, who? <laughs> seriously. I don't, I don't know. If you I know. did that, you'd be like... That would look like me. Yeah, but you know how superstars are. A lot of the times they surround themselves with yes men. So maybe these guys are like, yeah, you look awesome. Post that. If that's how good a boxer he is, I don't think he could knock me out with those punches. Well. They, now it bruised me, but. now, Well, now I'm thinking about you and McGregor in a ring. I don't want to fight him, but I'm saying if that's what he fights like. Remember that show Celebrity Deathmatch? Yeah, yeah. That reminds me of that. So Gordon Hayward uh, apparently is going to be signing a deal with the Celtics worth about $130 million um, over four years. And he was spotted by a fan at Joseph A. Bank in Boston because he needs a suit for Friday, which could be when he potentially does a press conference. Um, now, this headline says that he goes out to shop at a discount clothing store. Have you ever been in a Joseph A. Bank? Yes. Is it a discount store? No. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. You can buy. They're very expensive yeah, suits. Yeah, golf sweaters, slacks, nice sports coats, right. shoes. I consider a discount store to be something like Marshalls. TJ Maxx, Marshalls, all great stores. Yeah. But Joseph A. Bank isn't a... Buy my socks and underwear yeah. from uh, those discount stores. Yeah. You do? Yeah. Do you, but, like, do you go into them and you buy your underwear? What would be wrong with that? Well, I don't know. I feel like that's kind of like a thing you just pick up, like while you're out. Like, oh, hey, I'm at this store. I'll just grab some underwear too. But you like make a specific trip well, no, to Marshalls. I, for no, I'm, I'm saying socks? it's like once a year I'll go in and buy twelve pair of socks. Like, is that odd or something? Yes, that's so weird. Why is that weird? I don't know. The thought of you, like, once a year making your annual trip well, to I mean, Marshalls I don't plan it out. I'll look, I'll, I'll look in my <laughs> sock so drawer, and I'm like, I'm down to, like, two socks, and I'll just go buy a bunch of Where socks. Where did they go? I lose socks all the time. I started the show with socks on, and now I don't have socks on. My, I lose socks constantly. I'm learning way too much about yeah. you today. Yeah. Um, and finally, you know, I really want to know your take on this, because this has me kind of upset. There's been a trend recently of servers calling out celebrities for bad tips. Um, And Andre Robertson is the most recent victim of this. A guy, I'm I'm actually not going to say his name because we don't need to pile on him, but there is a waiter who posted on Twitter or Instagram. Oh, well, we put his name up there. But anyway, he said, I got, get, uh, he's talking about Andre Robertson gets paid $30 million for three years and he tips like this. You're trash. It's a $487 bill. He tips $1397. His math is a little off there. That does not equal $500. That equals 501 and 10 cents. Um, but that's besides the point. So that looks like it's a really bad tip, right? Yeah. About 3%. Yeah. So Andre Robertson wrote back and responded that he shouldn't have to tip you. It was just a bottle at a bar. There was no service. Now I can see if it was at a club, you're reaching broke. Well, you should have to tip if you just go to the bar and get a bottle. So he's got a bottle of champagne, really, really expensive yeah. champagne, and only tips $13. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with it, too. Yes, it's different. I, it's different. I wish if, he got his math if right. I, if I buy a bottle of $480 champagne at a bar, I'll yeah. give you a 20 There's no going a to the 20. kitchen, hot plates. And listen, this is a bad... I'm like, I, I'm, I am a very generous tipper. I usually give at least 11%. But in this instance, this is a needy 
waiter. Yeah. Well, I think like I follow the rule of 10% for to-go orders, or if I go to a if I go to a bar, it, it's weird. I used to be a bartender, so I get it. But if it's like someone orders three beers, you tip three dollars, like one dollar per beer is a good way to go. But if someone's buying a four hundred eighty dollar bottle of champagne, I think a twenty is probably appropriate. But that that but that this I, this this I, is not I, worth getting destroyed by. No, it's definitely not. But because of things like this, I don't know about you, but even if I have terrible service. At a restaurant, I still tip 20% because, and I shouldn't say that, but because I'm nervous about something like that happening or someone complaining that I tipped really bad. Do you think about that? No, but I, I'm so generous with my 11% tip yeah, that I don't have know, to worry about it. At your taco place <laughs> in Manhattan Beach. Christine with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Line News. Let's go back to Las Vegas Summer League. Lonzo Ball debuts tonight via the Coward Global Satellite Network. <laughs> Veteran NBA reporter Rick Buecher, Sirius XM, Bleacher Report senior writer. Okay, let's start with this. I'm so excited for tonight. I want to start, though, with the off season. Before I get to the Celtics, which I think has been overstated what they've done, let's start with the Cavs. It just doesn't feel right. Right? Like they didn't do anything, right? How does that land with you? The the problem is that they didn't do anything, but they also they've suffered some losses. You lose David Griffin, you have a question as to who is going to be running the front office. Chauncey Billups says no to a five year deal. Obviously, uh, the reports are that he was low balled. But ultimately, you look at you're bringing the same team back that was the second best team in all of the NBA. You would think that things would be feeling good. But the number one issue here, Colin, is the fact that we don't know what the future of LeBron James is. And we've certainly seen him with one foot out the door before. We've seen how that impacts the team. They haven't been able. I don't know what they could do as far as recruiting, considering that they don't have a whole lot of cap space. But once you have LeBron and the uncertainty surrounding LeBron, that affects everybody in the organization, either there or potentially coming there. And so that's the number one thing. And the consensus around the league is that he's as good as gone, that his relationship with Dan Gilbert is frayed to the point that while he would love to bring more success to the people of Cleveland, the idea that he has to share that success with Dan Gilbert is just a little too much. Okay, Gordon Hayward in, Kelly Olenek and Avery Bradley out. I'm supposed to celebrate what Boston's doing. What do you make of it? I'm not one of those that's celebrating. If you had just added Gordon Hayward to what they already had, it makes them better. Does it make them the best team in the Eastern Conference? No. Everybody's confusing Gordon Hayward with Kevin Durant or LeBron James or Paul George. He's not that kind of guy. Joe Johnson was the guy that they went to in the clutch yeah. when they were in the playoffs. Gordon Hayward's not that that go-to, I need a basket in a playoff game type guy. He's a good player. He fits. He's a lot he's the wing version of Al Horford. So they added another good player, but it also cost them a couple of important pieces and they're still looking for that go-to guy that's taller than 5'8" that can get them a bucket with the game on the line. So uh, it's a good story. It's a nice story, but I don't know that this moves the needle any more than Al Horford going there last year. And I didn't. While well, they they won 53 games, and by record they were the best team in the Eastern Conference, we all know that that wasn't the reality. Um, I was sometimes I feel bad for organizations, fans. They, like at the end of the Raiders with Al Davis, I felt bad for Raider fans. They were trapped. I feel I, I feel bad for the people that you're tipping 11 percent and saying <laughs> that that's a healthy tip. That's, I was tongue in that's cheek. Who I feel badly for. Okay, so the Knicks go out and get Tim Hardaway, who they let go a couple years ago. I honestly, yeah, with all this money now in the enlarged cap, the bad teams just spend it poorly. Like when you look at the Knicks and Hardaway, what do you make of that deal? Well, look, I, I, for whatever reason, I saw, I feel as if I saw every Hawks Knicks game this past season. And I can tell you that Tim Hardaway Jr. torched the Knicks. And I, I actually wrote about it because people ran him out of New York, said he couldn't play in the league. Uh, don't take this as a defense of the deal because I think they actually could have probably gotten him for 25, 30 million less. But I know how the agent framed it. This is a starting two guard, 24 years old, on a playoff team. He's a two-way player. He's only going to get better. And you need to spend the money somewhere. And you made a mistake letting him go in the first place. So 
what's the going rate for a starting two guard on a playoff team? I, I guarantee you it figures out to be pretty close to what Tim Hardaway Jr. is getting. Now, I'm not defending it. It, it Again, they could have gotten him for a lot less. They could have made a similar argument that <laughs> just a year ago he was in the D League. So I, I, I'm not going to defend what the Knicks did, but I understand how they got to the number that they did. Earlier today, about an hour ago, I said, listen, there are times the NFL changed its PAT. Baseball's raised the mound and lowered it. You do see often yeah. in hockey, they just changed overtime. Take a guy off the ice. It doesn't mean you made a mistake. It means the world changed. Right now, the top 15 players in the league, I can argue, 13 to 14 are in the West. Is it not time for the fairness of everybody to go 1 through 16 and forget divisions and forget conferences? Colin, I don't know if you know this about me. I try not to be too reactionary, and I know that the league feels the same way, that things go in trends and cycles, and you don't change rules just because of a year or two. But clearly this is beyond that, and I agree with you. At this point, the idea that we could once again, and maybe not just for a year or two, but consistently over the next couple of years, considering where the talent is gone and the kind of deals that we anticipate them signing. I mean, just imagine, a year from now, LeBron is, is also in the West. And the idea that you would have three, potentially four teams in the Eastern Conference with sub-500 records being in the playoffs while you have teams with 48, 49, 50 wins in the West not making the playoffs as we did just a couple of years ago, I believe it's beyond a trend. That's, that's where we're going. And so I understand the, lo the logistics that you could have teams that are having to potentially fly across the country multiple times every series and that that's a disadvantage. That's not something that you want to create. So I get the, I get the geographics and why you would maintain it east versus west. But as, we, as you said, we, we need to be fair and at this point, I think the league needs to take a serious look at just seeding 1 through 16 when it comes to the best records as opposed to having eight in each conference. And finally, Rick Buecher, Sirius XM, Bleacher Report, senior writer, got a podcast, BJ and Buecher podcast, which I listen to as well. Okay, here we go. I don't remember Summer League 15 years ago being this big of a deal. I think the Lonzo <laughs> Ball thing feels gigantic, and I'm just probably ridiculous. Yeah. But you've been to a few of these. Does it feel bigger this year? Oh, not just this year. I mean, the last couple of years. It, it is phenomenal what is happening here in Las Vegas. They are filling the Thomas and Mack Arena, especially for Laker. They were doing it last year already for Brandon Ingram. They were filling the place to the gills. I imagine it's only going to be more of the same. It has become gargantuan here, not just with Lonzo Ball. Uh, I, look. People are tuning in to Orlando and Utah in order to see the first matchup of Markel Fultz and, and Jason Tatum. It's become a monstrous thing. It's actually not good for guys in my position because you used to be able to kind of hang out and talk to people and, and it was, it, it was easy to get around and, and see and talk to whoever you wanted to. Now it's, it's almost like going to a regular season game where you've got security, you've got crowds, and all of the GMs and executives are, are hiding out trying to avoid the crowds and the media. Rick Buecher with the uh, herd microphone feels like a member of the staff. Fantastic. Rick, have I, a... I know. What about that? Nice look, buddy. Thanks for coming on. You got it. I've been so much fun today. We did two live shots. I know, with two different reporters. I, with geez. the herd microphone. Yeah, that's new. It feels, I don't know, listen, apparently there is a surplus in the budget because that microphone could cost 10 grand. That or was that was a dollars. network level microphone. When did you, yeah, when did you order these? John said it was just a sticker. Yeah. It, to me, it felt like a network microphone. The quality, the resonance. I well, thought network it, microphones are stickers. I think uh, Shanksy upstairs opened the old uh, pocketbook. <laughs> Paid for that. That looked really nice. Uh, okay, we wrap up what has been so much fun today. It's the herd. Great to have you and Lonzo Ball debuts tonight. So fired up, ridiculously fired up, over the top fired up. I told Chris. Christine asked a question earlier, and I thought it 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 really. Nobody ever asked me that, so I what I said is, I never, when I was a kid and I watched sportscasters, 
And I had, you know, like every little kid that wanted to be a sportscaster, I had my favorite sportscasters. And I always liked the guys who aged well, like Jim McKay was always happy. Like Jim McKay didn't get crusty at the end. Howard Cosell got crusty and angry at the end. I never wanted to be that sportscaster. That I wanted to be joyful and have fun and stay youthful as I got older. Because I, I didn't want to be like bitter old guy who just wants to ramble on about golf and the good old days. The good old days weren't that great. Sports has never been better than it is. I can get any game I want whenever I want on any dish. I can get stuff on my phone. I mean, I can remember when I grew up as a kid, like you had to wait to get the paper to get box scores. They had one game a week on baseball. If you're a fan now, you can get anything anywhere. You can get it streaming. You can get it TV. My radio show has got a podcast, AM, FM, XM, TV, Facebook, YouTube. If you're busy, you can get my show. Like, if you can't find my show now, brother, I'm sorry, but you have to actually, it's not the 60s. There's like a million places to get everybody's show. So I think sports has never been better. And I love the idea of getting into a story early than being the crusty old guy that complains about stuff. So I think Lonzo Ball to Summer League, I think it's going to destroy the records. And I'm really excited for it. Now, I don't know how good he's going to be. I think he's going to be a really nice NBA player. And I like what the Lakers are doing. But um, the, the Summer League didn't matter like 15 years ago. It, just, it didn't matter 10 years ago. But I think what it's showing is how we are becoming in this nation very much a football and basketball nation. And when you're hosting a national show, And there's local shows, there's regional shows. I'm doing a national show. I would do a different show if I was in Buffalo locally. I'd talk hockey. I'd have to. But as a national (laughs) host, increasingly, I follow your direction. And August 15th to February 15th, you better talk football, NFL college. And go take a ski vacation. After that, March 1st to now, you better talk basketball. Start with college, go to pro. And the numbers don't lie. I just got 8 million podcast downloads last month, a new record. That beats my football seasons. So you are speaking. You are into football, college, and pro, and you are into hoops, college, and pro. That's what you're into. And that doesn't mean I can't go to the baseball all-star game. That doesn't mean I t- can't talk baseball playoffs, World Cup, UFC. There are moments for everything. But I think this summer league, the extension of the NBA season, is just showing the thirst and the hunger for basketball in this country. It's growing on an annual basis. Andrew Luck has not thrown a football in six months. His star receiver said yesterday, T.Y. Hilton, I told him, man, just get healthy. That's the main thing. If you're not healthy, don't throw. The main thing is just get healthy. Maybe you can go to two-a-days. That's all we need. Yeah. By the way, impulsive owner, underachieving franchise, five years, three playoff appearances by the Colts. He hasn't thrown in six months. I'll just tell you, Andrew Luck's record as a starter is 43-27. and 27. There was one game last year he did not start. They lost 28-7, to 7, and their only touchdown was set up by a completed pass by a punter. A punter that was so old, he has since retired. So you guys can say what you want about Andrew Luck, and you can claim that I'm over the top. But I believe he's the most valuable player in the NFL for his franchise. That the Patriots can win and have won, have a winning record without Brady. I think here's the MVP, and he has not thrown in six months. And by the way, if you think I'm wrong, and they have great coaches and a great owner, I take you back to when they played the Patriots. Here's the wizardry the coaches came up with. You remember this play? You remember that play? That trick play? We don't have audio on it. That was the trick play they came up with, which was at the time many thought Chuck Pagano should get run out of town. Here is the sound. Little... Deception here by the Colts on a fourth down and three coming up from the 47. A snap to Anderson, and he bobbled it, and he's brought down by Bolden. My God. The Colts and everybody. The whole right side of the line was not on the line of scrimmage. Offense, this penalty is declined. The result of the play is first down for New England. So you have the whole punt formation. Yeah, that's the wizardry the Colts came up with two years ago. 
Um, so we went to Vegas twice today for the Lonzo Ball debut. Rick Buecher was on. Uh, Mark Medina was on. Um, here's Mark Medina. I asked him. I said, this feels big to me. You're in Vegas. Game tonight. Lakers Clipper. Lonzo Ball debut. Is it big tonight? There's still tickets left tonight, but it's almost at near capacity. Tomorrow's game, the Lakers and the Celtics, it's already sold out. So if, if you were uh, thinking of, hey, I'm going to uh, play it by ear, see what happens in the debut, it, you kind of lost your chance. So they're going to get 18,000 people <laughs> to a basketball game with primarily non-starters, undrafted draft picks, international guys, and it will be sold out. Now tell me, how can you argue the Lonzo Ball effect? That that is something. That is big. 18,000 people for a summer league game. Lonzo Palooza at the Thomas and Mack Center <laughs> in Las Vegas. All right, Monday, Christine and I are at the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. Do you know who's on our show Monday live from Miami? No. A- Alex Rodriguez. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wow, and J Lo might be there too because they go everywhere together now. Oh, do they? Yeah, mm. they were at the Fourth of July, and A Rod came. That'd be awesome. Yeah, think she'll come to the show. Let's ask. We know some people who know A Rod here. So A Rod's on the show, mm-hmm. and uh, oh, and as we do the show live, uh, this is not planned, but Pitbull. Yes. In the first hour of the show, will be. What do they call it? Practice? Sound check? The sound check. Yeah. For the All-Star game. So he's from, Pitbull's from Miami. Mm-hmm. So Tuesday, uh, Joe Buck, Chris Carter, Nick Wright. Um, so it's very exciting. Oh, Joe so, Buck too. Yeah, Joe Buck's like going to be there. He wanted to come on the show. We didn't, we barely had to ask him. He was very excited. I love that. So Alex Rodriguez. I've interviewed Alex. I'm not sure if I have. I've talked to him off the air a lot. I've never, I'm not sure if I've had. He Alex. hasn't been on the show. I'm not sure if he has. I forget. I wasn't here if he was. Are you sure, John? I've never had. It's just interesting. Talk about a bunch of stuff. He, yeah. I mean, that guy, he is a sports junkie. Like A-Rod watches. He's the last guy in America that watches regular season baseball. Like he'll watch just hours and hours of it. He's an encyclopedia. Like he's watching pitching zones and strikeouts and graphs, and the guy knows his stuff. Speak for yourself later today. Go to theherdnow.com, theherdnow.com, all sorts of free stuff. Christine and I are in Miami Monday and Tuesday. We'll see you there. Have a safe weekend. This.